Hello everyone. Hello. My Hello. name is my name is George uh, Cassiotis. I'm the managing director at Minusia, and I'm very excited to have uh, a person I'm connected with for quite a few years now, and someone I've been always, you know, uh, admiring for his knowledge and expertise when it comes to all things around content and more specifically content for for a search audience, SEO content, as many people call it nowadays. Um, Bernard, welcome. Thanks for having me, George. The pleasure is all mine. I've always respected you for your extreme knowledge in, in SEO. So the respect is mutual. So I've, I've just taken a look at this presentation, you know, when we were just talking about, about this webinar and it's really mind blowing the, the things that you will share with us today. Before we start, let me just give a, a brief, like uh, a very short bio. Bernard is the co-founder at ClearScope, the leading SEO content optimization platform that helps increase search traffic at companies like Adobe, Intuit, and HubSpot. Before that, Bernard was the SEO consultant behind brands like AllTrails, Trava, DoorDash, and Compass. Okay. Stick with us until the end because there is a lot of value there. And uh, Bernard, the stage is yours. Thanks so much, George. And welcome to our wonderful talk about the future of SEO content. It's been a buzz lately when it comes to SEO content. Just in the last three to six months, we've had so many different developments happen in SEO with the rise of chat to GPT, Google adding an extra E experience to their EEAT, rolling out the helpful content update, now Bing having you know, their own chat system in their search engine and Google responding with BARD. Lots has been going on. So let's dive into what I think is the future of SEO content. I figured I would start by asking ChatGPT what it thinks is the future of SEO content. And this is in a lot of ways why people are nervous, concerned about the rise of AI when we look at what's written here, it comes out reading fairly well, right? The future of SEO content is likely to focus more on user experience, expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. It even spells out EAT, missing, of course, the experience part, which is rather new. But you read this, you look at it, and you say, wow, you know, how is this going to influence content moving forward? Well, that's what we're here to talk about. George already gave a fairly comprehensive intro about myself. So just the co-founder at ClearScope, we help a lot of different businesses and brands manage their content process and create high quality, relevant content that meets the needs of the searcher and ranks on Google. Today, what we're going to be talking about is the evolution of Google's main content algorithm updates how Google is actually determining content helpfulness, this emerging concept of information gain and how it relates to a topic lifecycle, the fact that search intent and topics will change over time, some ideas on how to think about your content strategy moving forward with search perspective frameworks, and ultimately where we're going with the future of SEO content. So what has Google been up to? A lot, really. Lots of algo updates and you know, tweaks that they've been making to their search engine. Just to bring it back to the start, right? Google's mission statement, which has been around for the longest time, is really to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Now, this has not changed since the start of search. But a lot of things have changed since the start of search. You can see here that Google search probably started in the early 2000s, but it wasn't until lately, 
where you see this faster improvement of content algorithm releases happening. Starting in 2011, you had the big Google update content, which was Panda, which was essentially saying, okay, you know, if this content is duplicative, you know, it's found elsewhere on the internet, we're going to find the original source and essentially drop all of the copycats from the search index to the best of our ability. And you had Freshness and Hummingbird and a Rank Brain Fred, Medic, Bert, Product Review, Google Helpful Content, EEAT, and now in 2023, this idea of Bard coming out. So the point that I wanna make here is that for the first 10 years of Google, it didn't really care that much about content, right? It was looking more at technical SEO considerations and links. But as you can see here, as we're entering 2023, there's a lot more that's been going on with content and Google's insistent that content must be high quality and meet the standards of what they want. Now, if you've you know, kind of been thinking about search for a while and you took a look at this, this would be a Google Search Console screenshot of a topic life cycle is what I want to call it, SEO content life cycle. So when you first publish content, you'll notice there's this little question mark pointing to some orange dots on the graph. It goes through what I call a sampling phase, right? Google wants to seed the content initially in the search results, mostly to test how users are initially engaging with the piece of content. During that phase, what the most important considerations from an SEO perspective would be technical SEO, right? You need to make sure that Google can access the piece of content in the first place, that it can load it in a fairly time sensitive and responsive manner. And then from there, it becomes around backlinks topical authority, your content's comprehensiveness and brand. From there, right, as the uh, sampling basically starts to actually catch and Google feels comfortable giving your content a lot of searchers, then you're playing the user engagement signal game. So not gonna spend too much on, on this, but how Google determines initial content helpfulness is that it's gonna look at your backlink profile, right? Your domain authority is going to look at how your related subtopics surrounding the main topic that you've written about are performing. And if your related subtopics are doing well, then it's going to have more confidence that your topic that you just published is also likely to do well. People call this topical authority. George has an amazing webinar that he did for ClearScope. You should check that out if you want to learn more about topical authority. There is this idea of comprehensiveness as scored by using Google's knowledge graph, which you can see here visually represented but it's essentially a relational database of entities or concepts like this. And you have what I call the brand data search halo effect, which is to say that you can see here in this screenshot, um, lots of people will search by vacuum and Google is sensing that when they don't include best by vacuums that people have to go and research best buy vacuum and therefore you see best buy and their vacuum category doing really well you could then theoretically understand the branded search halo effect by looking at this like screenshot essentially when google constructs a search engine results page without best buy on the left then 50 hypothetically speaking 50 percent of people I'll go, oh, okay, well, I want it actually Best Buy. When they include Best Buy as result number one, we could say that maybe 75% of people have no further search. Therefore, Google says, okay, you know, this search engine results page with Best Buy is better than the search engine results page without Best Buy. In general, right, the more heavy or, you know, positive 
your, your brand is, the more that people expect it in the search engine results and they'll train Google by actually doing a navigational search for exactly your brand. You can kind of further imagine this if you were searching for best credit cards, you didn't see nerd wallet and you like literally went back to Google and search best credit cards, nerd wallet. You're essentially training Google that a search engine results page for the topic that you initially searched without the brand is not good. And so you have this like branded search, like navigational type intent that also Google factors in to basically how your website performs in relation to the topics that you want to rank for. So a closer screenshot then of this initial sampling process. Uh, you have four kind of main parts. If you are just starting out or you don't have much domain authority in comparison to the competition, obviously you'd want to build more links. If right, you have basically not that much content associated with the topic or your existing content surrounding that particular subtopic is not doing well, the way that you want to push that content up or make Google take another look to sample your content would be to refresh your existing content and wait or to create new content targeting the different subtopics the user is likely to care about. The knowledge graph, you know, that's why content optimization with ClearScope is so effective because you're basically checking all of the different boxes that the user is likely to care about for a given topic. And then branded search halo effect is something that's really hard to directly influence, but that just kind of happens over time. This is also why you'll kind of hear in TV ads, radio ads sometimes that somebody might say, search on Google for blah, 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 right? Like for best buy vacuums and click on the first result. That's kind of trying to push people to influence the search in that way. But really, it's just going to happen as your website and your brand becomes more authoritative and just a bigger, larger entity. So we've covered that initial slice of right how to influence the, the sampling that Google has. But what about the rest of the search intent or topic lifecycle? Well, how Google calculates user engagement is best seen through the light of a search engine results page that has the highest likelihood of concluding a search journey. So what that means in practice can be demonstrated by a couple slides like this. So on the left, you have a search that I performed for bone broth. And you'll notice that results number one and number two will say how to make bone broth and top bone broth benefits. Now you'll notice on the right that I have screenshots for the singular search bone broth recipe, which you'll see the how to make bone broth guide. And then down below it, you have bone broth benefits, which you'll see is the same article that you see on the left. What's happened here is that on the left, when a user has performed a search for something like bone broth and Google has not included results that instruct people on how to make it or tell them what the top benefits are, that searcher has to go back to Google and perform an additional search. So you can imagine right on the left, if it's three results that just say, what is bone broth? What is bone broth? What is bone broth? A lot of users getting those types of results are going to be unsatisfied. Well, what are they gonna do? They go back and perform an additional search for maybe how to make bone broth or the top benefits associated with it. Therefore, right, when Google tests, a search engine results page that has recipe and benefits in the top couple of spots, it finds that fewer additional actions or searches are performed by the user, in which case Google can infer that that search engine results page is doing a much better job meeting the needs of the searcher, and it's going to stick to that as the search engine results page for that topic moving forward. 
you just have to know that you only have one title tag and one above the fold experience. So you'll want to serve the most engaging above the fold experience that matches what the searcher wants. A lot of people get this wrong in that for something like, you know, how to make bone broth, they will literally still start with an H1 or H2 that says, what is bone broth? Come on, the user is here to learn how to make it, not what it is. They would have searched for something differently if that were the case. So now we're moving on to then one level deeper, which is this idea that has been floating around called information gain. What the heck is information gain and why is it important? So information gain in a very basic sense can be described as concepts or entities on the fringe of Google's knowledge graph. So back to this knowledge graph illustration that we have here, I got some arrows and they point to Renault, France and Macron, right? And those are related to Paris. So Renault and France and Macron, right? These are going to be information gained that's on the fringe of the topic known as Paris. Now, where this starts to come into play is within the context of agreement upon us as people who contribute to the internet for that particular topic. That is to say, certain topics have a high amount of, I'm calling it information symmetry. If everybody agrees that X is X, then we have a high amount of information agreement or symmetry. If that is the case, then you want to beat a highly symmetrical search engine results page with relevant information gain. Okay, so in this particular example, we have what is X and what is X, right? Everybody has more or less agreed that email marketing or search engine optimization is more or less the same things. What Google is then looking at when evaluating content to rank in the top spots is how comprehensively that content is covering the subject matter, obviously also looking at brand and backlinks and that sort of thing. But you can imagine if we're talking about okay, we want to rank even higher for search engine optimization, which has a high amount of information symmetry, then what you'd want to do is basically create a piece of content that's more comprehensive than everything else. In this particular case, right, we'd want to be also bringing new information to the table that matches where the topic might be going. So the concept of information gain then states that, okay, if we're talking about what is search engine optimization, you know, one distance away from the core topic would be things like backlinks, keyword research, domain authority, technical SEO. Right? These are things that Google knows and we know are very closely associated with search engine optimization. Now, a little bit further from search engine optimization, you're gonna to start to find topics like video. SEO or TikTok, or in this particular environment, GPT-3, chat GPT, Bing, right? These are going to be emerging relevant entities close to knowledge graph surrounding search engine optimization that are starting to form and appear on the fringes. So when you're competing then with a topic that more or less everybody agrees on, Google wants to know what is the new information gain that your content is adding to the ecosystem of content surrounding that particular topic. You can't do it just by throwing completely random stuff inside your piece of content, right? Let's say we talk about Porsches and Lambos in our piece of content surrounding search engine optimization. Well, Google is going to look at that and say, well, yeah, that's new information gain in the sense that nobody really talks about it. But from the distance that I perceive surrounding search engine optimization, that's just too far removed, right? That's like three or four arm, arm's lengths away 
Whereas things like TikTok and GPT, right, that's interesting stuff. I'm seeing bubble up on the fringes of this topic as I understand it. And I want to see more of that. So it's very important to then start to understand what your strategy for your content is depending on how much symmetry or agreement there is surrounding the particular topic. Now, information symmetry at its highest confidence produces featured snippets. That's why those exist, right? If I'm Googling how many legs does a dog have and Google is close to 100% sure that it's four legs, it's just gonna give me the exact answer. Now we see this evolve and change over time as topics evolve and change over time. And we also see this evolve and change over time as society changes, right? If we all of a sudden have weather apps and smartphones, we're not gonna be Googling weather as much or that kind of stuff. So the flip side of this is that certain topics and certain topics at different stages of their life cycle are going to have a high amount of information asymmetry or disparity. And that's this notion that we as participants of internet content creation and society just don't really agree on the same thing, right? Like I might think one way about say crypto or non-fungible tokens, but other people are gonna have a lot of different opinions because right, the topic is a lot newer. In these cases, right, disparity or disagreement results in more aggressive Google sampling because Google's ability to produce a search engine results page is not that great in producing or concluding right, a search journey. So it says, okay, I've tried three results. A lot of people are performing additional searches. Well, you know, I tried you know, a completely different set of stuff and it's better, right? Say 50% no further searches, but that's still not that great. So as a result, when you're starting to create content where you perceive that the topic has not settled in the sense that, right, a lot of people still are interested in a lot of different viewpoints that present you the opportunity to shortcut rankings by presenting new search perspectives. So you can see in this example, Right, so I have this thing as like, should you X? And the number one answer in this example is a perspective that prevents a further search. Whereas the number two is literally just that very long comprehensive piece of content that just describes, you know, like what is X? So in essence, right, information similarity informs where we're at in a topic life cycle. To put it in a more like basic sense, right, when a topic or you know concept is first invented or born you know we we just don't know what it is and we're kind of in this world of like chaos whereas you know as we start to develop more interest in this particular topic people are going to care about things like insights and experience and unique points of view as the topic matures even further right they just kind of want to know well, why is this important for me or not and you know how it works. And as it starts to graduate into you know, complete maturity, then it kind of starts to become pigeonholed into the traditional topic cluster model that I'm sure we're all familiar with. Like what it is, how to do it, what are the best things to help you do it, so on and so forth. And in certain cases, like facts, history, we're just gonna end up with a featured snippet because we all, as you know, a society more or less agree that X is X and Y is Y. So you can imagine then that this brings up this concept of a topic life cycle with content decay and search intent shift. So again, right, let's say half of the battle is getting a piece of content to rank in the first place. The other half of the battle is to maintain your rankings over time. And especially with the advent of AI content, we're gonna see an explosion of commodity Me Too content that's going to be challenging the incumbents in a very aggressive manner. So how do you future-proof 
your SEO content and cover all of the bases. Well, you can see here that content decay is just this idea that topics change over time, right? What was a search engine results page for say COVID one year ago is gonna look radically different than one month ago, one month from now, one year from now, and of course, the farther future. So as an example, back to bone broth, right? We have a number two result that simply says, these are the top benefits associated with bone broth today. You'll see here that in a Google Trends that bone broth interest peaked three, four years ago. And you can imagine that a search that was performed back then was actually questioning the validity of the benefits of bone broth. Like, is it beneficial or just a fad? So you can imagine, right, that this is now a way to think about how a topic could evolve over time. You have at the start, people just wondering, okay, well, what, what is bone broth? And as right, that starts to gain some adoption, it might then graduate into people caring about the top benefits to the point where it's become super trendy and people are questioning the validity of whether it has benefits. And then that's where the experience viewpoint comes in where people can then reaffirm people searching that like I drank it and here's what it did for me. So the traditional topic cluster and spoke approach, right, is the who, what, when, where, why, how, so on and so forth, except this doesn't really fit into this model of how a topic is likely to evolve over time, right? Another way you could think about it is that, right, as a topic first comes out, people want to research it, find more informational content, then it graduates into, you know, some more commercial intent, like, you know, top products related to that topic. And then finally, it's just like, okay, I just want to buy it. So that's to say that within a topic life cycle, you're going to have a lot of emerging topic perspectives that the user could care about as we see a topic change over time. So people might want to know, you know, why they should drink it and the top benefits associated with it. But then they might want to know, you know, are we sure bone broth has benefits, right? Some additional research, you know, how it specifically affected somebody who drank it, you know, an expert viewpoint, all of that stuff. Which then brings us to this idea of a search perspective framework. What do searchers want to know at different stages of each topic life cycle? So here I present to you some ideas about how to approach SEO content strategy moving forward. You'll see here, um, start a blog. So this is the search perspective that I'm calling consideration. Right. When somebody is trying to do something, right, how to train for a marathon, how to start a blog, how to get into ketosis, whatever, then there's going to be generally this idea that users are going to care about like this. Right. So a topic, how, you know, how to, you know, start a blog. Well, you can imagine somebody might want to know things to consider before starting a blog then the actual target keyword of how to start a blog. Then you can imagine as they're starting the blog, they might want to know the common mistakes while starting a blog. And as they're considering starting a blog, maybe they might want to know reasons not to start a blog. These all are different perspectives you can imagine that us as human beings would care about when considering doing anything. And thus, right, we kind of see a lot of different ideas start to form from a content strategy perspective, things to consider before doing X, challenging topics, right, common mistakes while training for a triathlon, and reasons not to, you know, do X are all different perspectives that a user can care about. And we see them ranking in Google. Let's see here. I mean, I've been talking about this experience viewpoint for at least a few years because I think that, you know, us as searchers, we we're pretty good at seeing seeing through, you know, some of the BS that we see on some content uh, and some websites. 
right? And when somebody goes in and provides a very thorough experience viewpoint like this for Soylent, I think this is number two, one month living on lab-made liquid, here's what happened, right? These are really good for reviews specifically. I think that the whole experience bit was mainly focused on uh, affiliate, like the affiliate space when Google added the additional E because a lot of things just did not look trustworthy. So X review, uh, consumer related topics like travel and packaged goods, right? People just want to know like, hey, did you actually try it? So yeah, you had, you know, best products surrounding this particular topic. And then you had, you know, I tried drinking Soylent for 30 days and here's what happened. And then here's all the evidence that I can provide. So, right, experience is, is really good for just consumer related things. Anything that somebody could experience, right? Like a review of a product or a travel experience, honest review of X, right? I did X, here's my review. People are gonna wanna know that, not just this is what's best about this vacuum cleaner and this is what's bad. Well, here's the pros and the cons. Contrarians is a very interesting one. You can see here, um, if you Google learn to code, then you get this TechCrunch article that says, please don't learn to code, right? You can imagine that contrarian is gonna be best for really new, trendy topics and industries, you know, topics that don't have as much backing in terms of a research, again, that generally implies that it's new, and generally bold claims that people might be making around a particular, you know, thing. So, right, like you can imagine the contrarian viewpoint, you can take it for what X is dead. Should you try X? Please don't X. As a matter of fact, if you Googled um, AI content generation, I think we have a piece of content that is the featured snippet that's like, should you use AI for content generation? And then the rest of the search results are like, oh, you know, best tools to you, you know, do AI content generation with. So we are able to shortcut right, the search engine results page because we provided a viewpoint or perspective that was ahead of the curve of what people were thinking about as it related to um, at least AI content in that example. So um, you can see here, right, another way to think about it is when you say like, oh, top benefits associated with X. You can then say, okay, you know, does X actually have benefits? Should you actually do X? And of course, you could provide the head term, right? Like 12 benefits associated with using AI content for generation. But each of these, you can imagine at some point, could be variations of subtopics that a user can care about. All right, some other ones, you know, I haven't clearly fleshed these out as much, but these are going to be things that I see showing up. So you have the expert viewpoint, right? These are going to be things like, you know, eight essential lessons the experts taught us about blah, or we surveyed 23 medical doctors, and here's what they have to say about keto. You know, these are just another framing that you can imagine a user could care about as they're doing some research around certain kinds of topics at different life cycles. You have a search perspective of a discussion, right? These are generally like used for like, is it okay? Like, should I? You know, that, that sort of things where, again, you can imagine from a like a information symmetry perspective, it's gonna be a lot grayer, right? Or probably closer to the 50% where when I Google one week's notice, right? Like, do you think one week's notice is acceptable? Well, I do, well, I don't, right? So there's not common ground. And in that particular case, when you saw, see this like forum type uh, content results show up, well, it's because, right, people want to know different people's perspectives. Now, you don't have to, of course, answer this by then creating the forum on your website, but you can imagine you could take a look at this and say, okay, clearly, right, it's like people don't know. So we could then say like, oh, you know, HR professionals surveyed. 26 you know, opinions on whether one week's notice is acceptable. So we have basically constructed the same perspective that the user wants to consume just in an article format 
And we know that that's what they care about because we're seeing them show up in the search results. Obviously, you know, leveraging current events to produce article ideas like what I have here with COVID, right? You've got this for Googling travel ideas because again, that's what people are searching for and clicking on. The last one I'll just leave you with is this idea of predicting the future, which clearly depends on your subject matter expertise, right? AMP is now doesn't really help with at least, you know, search engine optimization results directly. Obviously, it still reduces your page load speed. So people are constructing like, oh, should I disable it when searching for Google AMP? And then obviously, there's this whole like quiet quitting trend. Is it real? Is it happening? You know, who knows? It really just depends on your subject matter expertise. What I'm calling this as a contrast to what a lot of people know from Brian Dean, Backlinko, Skyscraper, right? More and more and more, build it up, build it up, you know, do everything. What I'm saying is instead of doing that, you kind of want to split your content out as, as granularly as possible, right? Instead of just bone broth benefits, you can imagine you could have top benefits, does it have benefits? Here's what experts have to say. I tried it and here's my experience. These could be now four additional articles that you create outside of your ultimate guide to bone bra. And now you set up your content strategy in a way where it matches what a user could care about at different stages of their search journey and the topic maturation, maturation. So then that brings us to the future of SEO content. You know, obviously AI has, has been on the tips of everybody's tongues. So talking a bit about how all of this works. So AI content for SEO is essentially a sophisticated autocomplete. So you can imagine autocomplete is nothing new. Google's been doing this for a really long time by saying that when you Google like the quick fox, then it's a very high likelihood that you want jumps over the lazy dog. Now, for those of you that aren't aware, this is that one sentence that encapsulates all of the uh, English letters once within how the sentence was constructed. So that's then Google saying, okay, you probably want that. And the lazy dog, right? That one doesn't seem so good, but some people want that. So I'll just provide that there. So what GPT-3 and AI content generation is doing is exactly this. It's looking at entities or concepts in sentences and paragraphs, and it's using that to predict high likelihood outcomes that follow those sentences, words, and paragraphs. So AI content knows that the lazy dog is likely the way to complete this particular you know, phrase that I've given it. That is to say why you've seen AI content in the whole rage around it be so positive is because in a lot of ways, people are simply asking GPT-3 to create small amounts of content in the topics that they're caring about, right? What we're getting then is that small inconsistencies in short writing produces small discrepancies. And if we have, you know, sentence one being 99% accurate, which then is followed by sentence two, which is also, right, 99% accurate, over the course of a paragraph, we have a 95% correct paragraph. Now, where AI content begins to struggle is in two cases. Number one is when a topic is pretty new, then Google, or not Google, GPT-3 AI content doesn't have much data to work with. In which case, right, you can imagine a paragraph generated with less sample size of data only being 90% correct at sentence number one is going to result in a 59% correct looking paragraph at the end of five sentences. Or you can imagine, right, if I asked GPT-3 to create for me long form content, 
even if it was mostly accurate, that over the course of 20 paragraphs, that a piece of content is likely to come out looking a little odd, right? Because, right, Google, or not Google, <laughs> I keep saying that, GPT-3 just keeps having to like create things based off of, you know, these assumptions that it continues to make. So that's to say Google has had an updated view on AI content fairly recently in the last like week. And Google's updated take is that, sure, right, use it. You know, re we'll reward high quality content however it is produced. So that's a very interesting development in Google's view of, of AI. But does that mean that using AI content is going to ensure that you get results? And that itself is a pretty interesting question, which brings us to this following point, All right? This is the idea that, again, if we're talking about a topic where more or less everybody is in agreement as to what that topic is, the best answer that will likely surface is going to be entity rich, right? Basically content that includes as much of the fringes of the knowledge graph in comparison to other content with information and gain. So, right, if you're thinking about now how AI content works, and we're thinking that it's essentially a sophisticated, sophisticated autocomplete suggestion, the problem with most AI content is that it's not going to know what the fringes of the knowledge graph are, because the fringes of the knowledge graph happen quickly. Right. When I asked GPT-3 in the earlier screenshot, it didn't talk about AI content. It didn't talk about TikTok and, you know, Bard and all of these very fastly changing things that we as SEO practitioners are, are having on the tips of our tongue. So the problem with AI content is that, again, it's lagging in terms of its understanding of where a topic is heading. But of course, you know, when we're at very high degrees of information agreement and the topic itself is fairly static, you can imagine that, sure, AI content would do a marvelous job, you know, writing a memoir or history of, you know, the impact that Steve Jobs had on, you know, personal computing and Apple, because that's all been very well documented. However, right, AI content is going to struggle in identifying these like fringes of the knowledge graph, which is what Google, in my opinion, is going to be looking at, right? What are the relevant concepts that content is bringing to the table that matches where I think this content can go? ClearScope as a content optimization tool is designed to help you answer and fill in the gaps as it relates to well, relevant information gain, right? These terms that we give you on the right-hand side can be thought of as entities and concepts that surround, in this particular example, AI content generation, right? We, people are very interested in how that affects content creation as CM. And the further you scroll to down this list on the right, we'll get you terms and concepts that are further away from AI content generation as a knowledge graph, but those are going to be the things that you want to be including in your content. Now, that brings us to the other point of the future of SEO content, which is really kind of this like experience gain type thing, right? Which is, okay, if a topic is still fairly new, what you can do is you can present new relevant perspectives that prevent further searches. Right. So in this example, right, we're able to shortcut the top spots for a particular topic by addressing a perspective that the user is likely to care about. That obviously doesn't really care as much about the knowledge graph per se, but it cares a lot about right where where what's going on in the searcher's mind as they're doing research for the particular topic. This is then where the search perspective frameworks really start to come into play, right? If somebody's Googling 
you know, how to do X, then they're going through the stages of consideration for, you know, what they should care about. Also, right, a contrary viewpoint for something super new and trendy is likely to do well. Things where, again, the research is a little bit light, you might have the expert viewpoints, the experience viewpoints, the discussion viewpoints, current events, and predicting a future that could happen. So in ClearScope, what we're doing to address this is giving you a snapshot into your content relevancy over time. So we would score, right, basically, you know, your piece of content against a set of queries and then give you updates to say, hey, your piece of content is looking very topically relevant. And the moment that that topic starts to shift, you'd get an alert that says, hey, you know, you don't talk about, you know, chat GPT in your piece of content surrounding AI content generation. So you should probably include that because the topic is changing and your content is not. So these are gonna be the ways to start thinking about, right, your SEO content strategy moving forward is really by understanding, right, what is the range of perspectives that somebody's likely to care about and staying on top of refreshing and monitoring your existing content to make sure that it's evolving at the same rate that the topic or search engine results page is evolving. Wanted to bring up SEO content as it relates to video. So video, I think, is going to have a lot more prevalence on search moving forward, primarily because, well, Google owns YouTube. And it's a high barrier to entry. You know, when we first started practicing SEO, I don't know when y'all did, but 5, 10, 15 years ago, it was a huge pain in the butt simply to put text on the internet, get it crawled and get it indexed, right? Like building a website from scratch, it required enormous amounts of technical complexity. And here we are with, you know, your website builders, your little platforms that basically you click a button, you got a website. Well, guess what we're at now with AI content? You click a button, you get a piece of content. So now we click two buttons, we have a website and a piece of content. Well, the problem with that is that that's a very low barrier to entry. And as a result, we're gonna see a bajillion more websites and a bajillion more pieces of content. But that's why video makes a lot of sense, right? If you were to create a video, well, you're already way above the like trust barrier because it's not that many people create video. And the other thing about it is that consumption of video is normalized in work settings and just social environments in general, right? At work, I'm plugged in with my headphones, right? When you're commuting, maybe you're plugged in with your AirPods and you're watching videos, right? So normalized consumption of video means that video, I think, is going to play a much larger role in how we see SEO start to shape up. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. Any questions, thoughts? First of all, thank, thank, you, all. thank you very much, Bernard. That was, that was amazing. Yeah, we have a few questions. So the first one, which is also connected to AI content um, asked by Payman. Hi, I'd like to know if Google crawling bot will detect the content that is written by ChatGPT. If so, does it have any negative impact on the ranking on SERP or SEO generally? Yeah, that's that's the question by Payman. Thank you, Payman, for the question. Yeah, great question. I'm just going to bring up this Kevin Indig, Kevin Indig helpful content update thing here. So the answer is, is a bit more nuanced, but you can see here basically that um, Kevin looked at some website which basically brought nothing new to the table in terms of the information. It's just facts on like movie stars. And you can see here that basically what this screenshot is looking at is a analysis of words following words. So essentially, if it's green, it's like a very high probability that that word would have followed the previous word. And then from this, you can kind of see this idea of like, 
originality starts to form. So if everything were green, it would be pretty bad because, right, basically the piece of content wouldn't look that original. And then you can see here, right, these like red bits are like um, places where the, the content is like the computer didn't expect that to, to really come out. So you can see here, right, now this is basically how one thing looks for Wikipedia, and this is how one thing looks for, like, you know, through the cutter, clutter. I think that this is, I think that Google doesn't really necessarily care that the content was generated through AI or not. We also have kind of that blog post here, right, that, you know, I, George will have a, this presentation, but you can see here, right, rewarding high quality content, however it is produced. So the short answer is no, I don't think Google cares. But the longer answer is, okay, but, you know, what is Google actually looking for? And I think what Google is looking for is essentially this idea of, you know, like, entity rich content matching the fringes of the knowledge graph. So the problem that I see with a lot of AI generated content is that AI generated content isn't thinking as much about bringing new relevant information to the table because it's simply regurgitating everything that was already known. So I think that that is where AI content is likely to get penalized. And I think that's why helpful content update exists. And that's why you saw a bunch of websites like lyric websites, movie websites get penalized by Google was because their content was not bringing anything new to the table in terms of information gain. So I think you can use AI content to, you know, create outlines to generate, you know, large blocks of content within your SEO content. But if you're not bringing anything new to the table as it re re results in the, you know, like the fringes of the knowledge graph, I think that's where you're going to start to see problems. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard. Another one by Jess. Hi, to influence the halo effect, is it fair to recommend other marketing efforts like PPC to help drive search visitation? Thank you for your question, uh, Jess. Yeah, that's a good question. So this is in, in relation to this idea of branded search, right? Playing, playing a role in how Google calculates, you know, a website's ability to initially rank. And I'm just gonna say, no, not really. I mean, yeah, I think having PPC on average is better than not having PPC, right? If we were just to say you had infinite resources and, you know, like, you held everything equal, yeah, you should definitely pair PPC with your organic search efforts because more impressions from a brand perspective is just likely to do better. But, you know, if we're talking about where that money can go, like I think that, you know, building links would be just as valuable, if not more valuable than trying to influence this like branded search halo effect. Thank you, Bernard. Another one by Tony. Hello, per your example of the Tesla topic cluster and the concept of information gain, does this mean that in order for us to rank well for Tesla, we have to touch on or mention Macron, France, Renault, and so on and so forth? Sorry, that this could be a better um, knowledge graph, but it's literally kind of just saying that, okay, you know, Tesla Model 3, belong to, right, like their headquarters used to be in Fremont or something like that. And those belong to like California. So obviously then California is linked to Hollywood, which then is linked to Isabel, which is then linked to, you know, Paris and France. And then, you know, you get this whole like scattering of things. So in essence, it's, it's a lot more micro like, like this, right? It's not like, oh, to talk about, you know, a particular concept. You know, you have to reach, you know, like if we're talking about Tesla and all of a sudden talking about Paris and France and Macron, then, you know, that's too far away. It's just saying that, you know, to rank for, you know, the, the topics that you want to go after, you do need to identify what are the relevant concepts to add. And obviously that's going to depend on what the topic is, how quickly it's evolving, and your own subject matter expertise as it relates to it. 
the best example I can say is, again, within the context of search engine optimization, you would imagine that if we wanted to create a, a guide on how to do it, we would now include a section on AI content, GPT-3, and you know how that influences search engine optimization. But we would know that because again, we are practitioners of it. It's this new little say subtopic silo that's starting to grow within the topic of SEO. And that's, that's what's important. Thank you, Bernard. And we have one more by Siniad. I hope I, I got the name right. We are a huge e-commerce site that, by the way, this is a bit irrelevant, but maybe Bernard, you, you have something to, to share here. So we are a huge e-commerce site and we are focusing on entities, pillars, et cetera, similar to what you spoke about. However, our internal linking is automated, which I feel goes against what we are trying to do. How important would you say the, 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 relevant, the relevance of uh, internal linking is? I guess the question is here, we are talking about a big website as I understand it. And Sinead, let me know if I, I, I got this wrong, but you are a big e-commerce website. And your question is like, we, we do all these things that, or most of these things that you know, we, we discussed through this webinar. What about link building? We have it somehow automated or semi-automated. Should we you know, do something different? And how important, in general, internal linking is, you know, in 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 our efforts. Yeah. So internal linking is certainly very important. I think there's a lot of different ways to to think about internal linking. I think that there is this idea of like, you know, a distance from your homepage, and there's also this idea of a uh, scroll depth perspective as it relates to internal linking. I would say that more internal linking is, is always better and good just for the fact that you are preventing additional actions on Google theoretically better if you have more internal linking. So you can imagine you have this piece of content, we'll call it the ultimate guide to search engine optimization. Within it, we talk about you know, keyword research, internal linking, backlinks, chat GPT, and we link out right to separate standalone pieces of content that match those, those particular perspectives that the user can have, right? Something that looks closer to this, right? So this, we like have a section within benefits that are like, these are the top benefits within that. We question, you know, people might question whether it has benefits, check out our article that answers if bone broth actually has benefit. So each of these little ranches that you see would be standalone pieces of content that we would also have. The idea of why I think internal links are important is because, right, if you didn't have those and say you even had the pieces of content, well, somebody reading it might be like, huh, like maybe that doesn't have benefits. So what are they going to do? They're going to go back to Google and Google you know, does bone broth have benefits? When that has happened, you have essentially created a user interaction where somebody has landed on your piece of content and, you know, stayed for some amount of time, but ultimately went back to Google and did another search on a subtopic surrounding what you wrote about. I would view that then as a negative like interaction and that's why internal linking is important, but, um, yeah, if you just have some way to like auto automatically generate it, you know, it's not going to necessarily be as uh, powerful as, you know, like the just contextually pointing people in the places where they where they should go to find more information about the subtopics that they, they care about. We have one last question, and this will be the last one. I guess, you know, we have to do another webinar to discuss like just um, AI con because this is something that people are really interested in right now. So it comes from Abdel Rahman. And the question is among SEO professionals, the, the question is, will Google change its search engine format to compete with Bing's AI technology? As a result, Google will hide all results, only returning one result for the search. I guess, you know, it's, it's a bit tricky to try to, to make predictions on that level, how, you know, search this the search experience will look like 
in, in the future. But I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, Bernard, that could be of help here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to predict, but I'll just, I'll just preface it with this overarching idea that the SEO industry has had at, at least each paradigm like shift so far where we had social media and Google's response was like, oh no, you know, Facebook is going to take all of this content and people are going to stop searching. Instead, they're just going to post to their Facebook and say, what's the vacuum that I should buy? And they would expect their friends to basically have the right recommendations. And Google Plus was born and then sunsetted. Now, yeah, I don't even know if you remember this because it's, it's just a blip now, but this whole internet of things and voice search concept. Voice search is essentially what we were all fearing, I don't know, like five years ago, three years ago, where somebody would literally, you know, like, go, okay, Google, you know, what's, what's the blah? And, you know, if you're talking to your, your speaker or a refrigerator or a dishwasher or something, it's, it's only going to say, right, like the one response that it's going to say. And people are like, oh, my God, what are you going to do about voice search? It's like, well, I mean, I think voice search has changed how or influenced how a lot of queries work, right? Like, give me the directions to blah, right? You don't search on Google as much because you just go to Google Maps on your phone, right? In the same way that you don't search for weather as much, you just go to the weather app on your phone, right? So I think that what's happening is going to be a shift in how certain classes of queries how we interact with them, right? For kind of the main like stuff where all you need is one response or one sentence, right? We're sort of already getting those answers from voice assistants like Siri, you know, Google, Alexa, that sort of thing. And that was already happening anyways, but there's still gonna be a huge range of queries where people want 10, 20 links to click on to do a lot of research to figure out, you know, how, how to actually, you know, do something or, you know, whether this product is actually good. So my prediction, if you will, is that, yes, I think a lot of classes of queries will be disrupted as a result of AI content and Google's reaction to AI content, but there's still going to be, you know, a whole huge set of queries where those are not going to be disrupted because one answer is only satisfactory when we have really high information symmetry for the topic and most topics are not that high of information symmetry right people want to know some different opinions some different viewpoints and and that kind of stuff thank you bernard so that's a wrap i guess we can uh close here and uh, i would like to thank uh, you bernard first of all for giving this amazing talk and uh, preparing these slides it was just you know it was amazing really really well done and i would like to thank all people who who joined us and stayed with us until the end obviously there will be an email where we will share all the the slides and uh, some links you know for people to check out clear scope and so on and so forth and uh, yeah Bernard, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. And looking forward to, you know, do more things like, like that in the future. Thank you.